On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, Jesus' disciples ask him, Where do you want us to go to prepare the Passover meal for you? So Jesus sent two of them into Jerusalem with these instructions. As you go into the city, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him. At the house he enters, say to the owner, The teacher asked us, Where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will take you upstairs to a large room that is already set up. That is where you should prepare our meal. So the two disciples went into the city and found everything just as Jesus had said, and they prepared the Passover meal there. In the evening, Jesus arrived with the twelve. As they were at the table eating, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, one of you eating with me here will betray me. Greatly distressed, each one asked in turn, Am I the one? This concludes the reading of the scripture from Mark 14, 12 to 19. When Jesus and his disciples shared their last Passover meal in the upper room that night so long ago, Jesus announced that one of his closest followers would betray him. The disciples were dumbfounded, wondering how any one of them could do such a thing. Surely they must have looked around the table, wondering who it was. Did Thomas cast a glance at Nathaniel? Might John have gazed around the table, locking his eyes on Simon the Zealot? Who might Peter and Andrew and Philip suspected? Did Matthew just look up at the ceiling while Thaddeus wept? Yet each one also looked deep down inside their own soul, asking if it could be them. Earlier during the meal, they had argued with each other about who among them would be the greatest in the new kingdom that they believed Jesus was about to establish. But now, as they pondered their leader's words, their hearts were full of grief. With the twelve gathered that night, it is appropriate for each of us to ask the same question about betrayal. Yeah, I 
was standing when Philip met me. Such a revelation can only come from God himself. I said, Rabbi, you are truly the Son of God, the King of Israel. And right there, I put my trust in him and started following him as one of his disciples. But today, just now, at this Passover feast, he said one of us is going to betray him. This is insane. It's crazy. How could there be a traitor among his best friends? This has left me with a question that I keep turning over and over in my mind. Knowing my master for who he is, when he says something, it's for real. I keep asking myself, is it time? Is it time? My name is Matthew, though I'm sometimes known by my other name, Levi. I was a tax collector, going about my business one day when a stranger approached me and said, Follow me. So I rose and followed him. Not long after, I threw a party in Jesus' honor in my home. Many of his disciples, as well as my fellow tax collectors and friends, were in attendance. When they heard about this, some Pharisees were unhappy about Jesus eating with someone like me. They thought tax collectors were the scum of the earth, but they got rich by taxing people, cheating them. Jesus said to them, Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I come not to call on those who think they are righteous, but on those who know they are sinners. Since the day I chose to follow Jesus and ask forgiveness of my sins, I have studied the scriptures and believe that Jesus fulfills every prophecy of the coming Messiah. I have listened to his teachings. And one day, hope to record his words so that others may be blessed by them as I have been. His words are great news, not just for the Jewish people, but for the whole world. And yet, he has just spoken terrible news, tragic news, that one of us will betray him. How can that be? Will the others assume that it's me because I was once a hated tax collector? Is it I? Is it I? My name is James. To make sure I'm not confused with my fellow disciple of the same name, the son of Zebedee. I'm often referred to as the son of Alphaeus. I never forget the day I first saw Jesus. When I am passing down the road near the place where John the Baptist had worked. Curious to see what's going on, I drew closer. That's when I saw Jesus asking John to baptize him. At first, John refused, but Jesus insisted, so he was baptized. Immediately after coming out of the water, Jesus looked up, his arms extended, and then there was a noise. Some said it was a voice, but it was hard to tell. Jesus, though, was smiling. I decided to follow Jesus, and some months after, he chose me to be one of, one of his closest disciples. Since that moment, I have walked with him, talked with him, and prayed with him, tried to learn as much as I could. But now he says that one of us will betray him. 
It's a madness to think that this could be true. If one of us even thinking about betraying our Lord, that man is out of his mind. But I ask myself, is it I? Is it I?
Jesus came to my brother and I three years ago while we were attending our nets near the Sea of Galilee. We were honored when he asked us to follow him, and we were humbled when he chose us to be among the twelve closest to him. One day we came up with a plan. We asked Jesus, Father, when you sit in heaven on your glorious throne, we would like to sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right and the other on your left. He cast us aside with his glance and he said, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering that I must drink? Are you able to be baptized in the baptism of suffering, which I must endure? Boldly we cried, Lord, we are able! He looked at us and he said, You will drink from this, this cup, and you will be baptized with this same baptism. But it is not my privilege to dole out seats on my right and left. When the other disciples found out about our request, they were angry. But I think they were jealous that they didn't think that first. Jesus taught us that those with the most authority must be the first to serve others. And he demonstrated that tonight by washing our feet before supper. And now he, who taught us the way of love, is telling us that he is to be betrayed by one of those whom he most loved. How can this be? Who can it be? How can any one of us do this? But I look into my own heart and I ask, is it I? Is it I? I am Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. It was I who first introduced Peter to Jesus. Now, I'm not especially gifted, just an ordinary person like any of you. But I've tried my best to serve the Master with the gifts and talents that I have. Since I first introduced my brother to Jesus, it has been wonderful to see the gradual transformation in his life. I was also the one who found the lad that day with the five loaves and two bread, with the with the five bread and two fish that day that Jesus fed five thousand. And just recently, some Greeks were looking for the Master and I was called in once more to bring them to the Master. He must have seen something of value in me, because he chose me to be one of his twelve apostles. And we have been close ever since. I have been a friend and a companion to my Lord. What greater gift could afford a fisherman like me? And now, Someone is to betray him. It's unthinkable. But who could it be? How could one of us who know him so well rationalize such a horrible deed? But could it be me? Is it I? Is it I? My name is Philip. I am from Bethesda in Galilee. While all of my friends and I were in Bethany listening to John the Baptist preach, Jesus called us to be his disciples, so we turned and followed him. I remember so well before he fed the 5,000, asking him and the others, where can we buy enough bread to feed all of these people? But little did I know, Andrew had already approached a young lad who was willing to share his lunch with Jesus. When the Greeks approached me about a meeting with the Master, I turned them over to Andrew, who introduced them to Jesus. Our Master's teachings have often been hard for me to understand, like when he said that God was our Heavenly Father. But the more I listen to his words, the clearer they become to me, and the clearer God becomes to me. It is my opinion that if anybody wants to know what God is like, they should just look to Jesus. That might sound like a bold statement, to say that any human being could adequately reflect that of our Creator. But when I look at all that Jesus has said and done, 
He reflects the writings and teachings of Moses and the prophets about who God is. But now he shocks us with the announcement that there is a betrayer amongst us. Could one of our number be so blind? Do they not realize that in betraying Jesus, they are betraying God? That in conspiring against Jesus, they are conspiring against God? Who could it be? Could it be me? Is it I? Is it I? I'm tired of this. Jesus chose 12 of us to be the cornerstones of the new kingdom, just as the 12 tribes were the cornerstones of Israel. I feel unworthy to be numbered among his apostles, but he selected me. I will remember the day after Elijah's prayer, he called us to him and gave us authority over evil spirits, plus the power to heal every kind of disease. Then he commissioned us to go out and tell others that God's kingdom was present in a whole new way. He advised us to be as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves, since we will be declaring a whole new message that some will receive and some will reject. In all things though, our biggest assignment was to be like our master. I was in Jerusalem when he gave the great invitation. Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Let me teach you. I'm humble and gentle like that, and you will find rest for your souls. But now, the one who came to share abundance as an evolution to bear himself, the knowledge that one of his followers will betray him. Who can he be? Who is the traitor? Philip? Peter? John? Jesus? Or the one we least expect? Or will all of us betray him before the night is over? Me? Is it I? Is it I? I am Thomas, also known as Didymus, Didymus which means the twin. Some of my brothers think of me as a skeptic, a doubter. It is true that I ask for evidence before I believe in something. I want to see what the, what the proof is before I commit myself. But I consider myself to be fairly courageous. On the day when Mary and Martha sent word to Jesus that their brother Lazarus had died, Jesus turned to us and said, Let us go to Judea. That's where Lazarus' hometown, Bethany, was located. Now, we knew that opposition had developed in that region, so some of my brothers felt it was risky to go there. That's when I spoke up and challenged them all by saying, Let us go with him, even if it means dying with him. So, I wonder, why do people remember my doubting but forget my daring? As I think back at our years together, I remember how he mesmerized the crowds on the mountainside in Galilee during the first year of his service. How he rebuked the winds of a sudden storm that had risen when we were crossing the lake. He healed the worst kinds of sicknesses. He made blind eyes see and deaf ears hear. He healed lepers. And he spoke kind words to, the dumb, to those who were downtrodden. And yet, opposition has developed. And his enemies are determined to destroy him. He would make us God's servant. 
while they want to make God their servant. And now he said that even among his chosen twelve, there's a traitor. Who could it be? Is it I? Is it I? All the other disciples came from Galilee. But my home is the village of Karu in Judea. So I am known as Judas of Karu or Judas Iscariot. This makes me the only Judean in the group. The others must have had some confidence in me because they elected me as their treasure. <clears throat> and Jesus must have believed in me because he chose me as one of the twelve. Some have hinted that I used some of this money for my own purposes. They might even think that Jesus' words about love, money, and greed were directed at me. It is true, I complained when Mary washed his feet with expensive ointment and perfume. I think it was a waste of money. I must admit, I've had conversations with the chief priests and received 30 pieces of silver to supply them with certain information. But that's my own business. No one else's. I believe in Jesus, but someone has to prod him to assert himself as God's Messiah. He refuses to make a move, even though he's had multiple opportunities. I have decided to get the ball rolling. He hints that he knows what I have done. He made a comment about me when he was washing my feet. But my heart is not so corrupted as some think it is, nor is your soul so perfect. What would you do if you were in his place wanting him to make a dramatic move to usher in his kingdom? If you were in his place, isn't that what you would do? Should I ignore his statement about betrayal or like the others, piously and self-righteously ask myself, is it I? Is it I?
My name is John. After Jesus called Peter and Andrew to follow him, he came to me and my brother, James, as we stood in the next boat over, bending our nets. He invited us to follow him, too, and so right away, we left our boat and our father, Zebedee. Since that time, I tried to understand just who Jesus is and why he appeared among us. Through its words and actions, I've come to understand and see God so much more clearly. Though he has filled my mind and moved my spirit, the best is that he's captured my heart. Beyond all doubt, I know that Jesus loves me. And I love him. At times, he's called me the beloved disciple. And it's humbling to hear that. I've shared many unique moments with the Master. Peter, my brother James, and I have formed kind of an inner circle, and we have witnessed some events that the others have not. One day on top of a mountain, he became so radiant with an otherworldly glory that was so bright I had to shield my eyes. We were allowed to watch as he gave life to the dead daughter of a synagogue leader named Jairus. His words need to be heard by many, and so one day I'm going to compile a record of his teaching and deeds <coughs> so that others may read them and understand that Jesus really is the Messiah, the chosen one set by God of the world with a message of life. And yet he said that one of us will betray him. Who can that be? I cannot imagine that it's Peter or James or Andrew. Could it be I, the beloved disciple? Is it I? Is it I? I am Simon, the zealot. Before Jesus called me, I belonged to a group of hot-headed, bloodthirsty revolutionaries known as the zealots. Our goal was armed rebellion against Rome. We wanted to crush our enemies and restore the ancient kingdom of Israel to the glory days of David and Solomon. But Jesus taught us of another kind of kingdom, one that exists in the human heart where God reigns there supremely. Since hearing this, I have changed my mind and also my allegiances. Jesus has taught us that winning the battle for a person's heart is the only true and lasting conquest. So I have pledged my deepest loyalty and highest devotion to Jesus. In military terms, I have unconditionally surrendered to think his thoughts, to obey as he obeys our Heavenly Father, to love as he loves and whom he loves, and to serve as he serves. This surrender has not imprisoned me, but has set me free for the first time in my life. I no longer fear Rome. Caesar's empire is mighty, but God is almighty. And now the spiritual, and now our master says there's a spiritual Roman among us, one who would attempt by force what could only be conquered by love. Who could it be? Could it be Matthew? the former tax collector, or maybe one of the fishermen. Could he suspect me, suspecting that I have returned to my former allegiances? Is it I? Is it I? My name is Simon Peter. One day my brother Andrew and I were out on the Sea of Galilee fishing. We'd been there all day. We came back to the shore. When we got to the shore, Jesus came up. And he said, Simon, go back out. Cast your nets again. I replied, Sir, We've been out all day, and we have nothing to show for it. But reluctantly, we went back out. We let down our nets, and a 
Amazingly, the sea and our nets were filled with fish. We had to work so hard to pull them onto the boat that we recruited some of the other fishermen in the area to help us. When we got back to the shore, I fell at Jesus' feet and said, I'm not worthy to be in your presence. He smiled and said, Simon, follow me and we'll go fishing for people. So we followed him. On the way, as we were traveling, he started to refer to me as Peter, which means the rock. And he said that he would build his church on me. He also said that he was going to go up to Jerusalem and die there. And when I protested, he said, get behind me, Satan. I was very confused. First he said he was going to build his church on me, and then he called me Satan. I suppose he meant that inside of me is the capacity to do both good and evil. So now he said that one of us is going to betray him. When he said that, I replied, Never, Master, I would go to the death for you. He said, Peter, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. How can that be? I love him so. And if I knew who the betrayer is, I'd run him through with my knife. And yet, is it I? Is it I 